No, I can't either. Good morning to welcome you here today, and uh, we want to start with a couple of announcements. First off, next week is Mother's Day. Uh, we have some items planned for the moms and uh, a message as well planned for the moms, and so we encourage you to be here next week for that. The following week already, May 16th, Brent Savinsky, Lord willing, will be here, and uh, we encourage you to be here in the services, both in the morning, normal time, 1030, and then as well, if you're available, to come back at 3 o'clock for a, a graduation of sorts. It's a time when Brent gets to preach to the girls, and since he's pretty much known them since they were infants, it should be some good some good preaching at that point. <laughs> um, so anyway, that'll be at 3 o'clock in two weeks, and uh, as well, 1030, if you are interested. We'll be taking a love offering for him and his family on that day, or even if you'd like to give ahead of time and designate it, that's fine as well. Uh, but we like to be able to give them a, a love offering to support their ministry. Other than that, I don't... Oh, yes, yes, yes. The day before, so the 15th. Yes. That's how that will work. Uh, we like to have a bonfire. The girl, My girls have collected a lot of debris, yeah, sticks and logs and uh, things down there. And uh, so we may have enough fire to light the entire city up. Uh, but we encourage you, if the weather is good, if it's not raining or snowing, <laughs> uh, we'd encourage you to come that night before and we'll have uh, just a bonfire, probably just time of fellowship together, hot dogs and s'mores, gooey things. 
Yes, definitely chili. Chili to help hover the taste of the hot dogs. And um, we'll have that down down, at, down below and encourage you to be a part of that as well. Again, that'll be weather permitting, but uh, we'll intend on a meeting for that. Other than that, um, I don't know that we have any other announcements. As far as some prayer requests go, though, uh, we want to pray for Calvary Baptist. And at the moment, I cannot remember if it's Calvary Baptist Bible Church or Calvary Bible Baptist Church. So we'll just call them Calvary Baptist as I have it up there on the screen. I think that's what you put on the app as well. Uh, they are part of the AIBCI as we are, and uh, they have a number of cases of COVID in their church, some very serious, uh, a couple of deaths already, hospice. and hospice, and, and uh, certainly want to pray for the church, but as a pastor, uh, I would call out the name of the pastor as well. Was it Greer? Gear? Gear. No, just one R. Gear, Pastor Gear and family, they have, from what we are hearing, and they sent a message to all the pastor's wives, his wife sent the past message to all the other pastor's wives in the AIBCI, and uh, they are having to do a lot of, like, going through houses of their church members to find legal documents because they are dying in the hospital. And uh, this is really taking a, a big toll on them. And uh, I don't know how many kids they have. Two. And one of their daughters is also graduating. And uh, this has really hit her very hard. Oh, yes, Delaney, if you know Delaney. Um, apparently got sent home from school because she was just crying uh, over what they're just having to go through in their church. So certainly be in prayer for this church. But it's also a reminder as well of, of due diligence. I know we've had enough. I know I've had enough of this the whole mask wearing and all that other stuff that's going on. Um, and about every time that we think, you know what, we should start discussing though, getting back to maybe a Wednesday night. Um, again, numbers start going the opposite direction. And then, you know, cases like this, just in Peoria, um, where a number in a, in a church are uh, being impacted in that regard. And uh, so certainly pray for them. Calvary Baptist, uh, we still have Dr. Rogers and uh, Jean. Okay. Jim Work, I think, is. It's a. Yeah. Not a little like this. Yes. Very good. Then. I think all these, and obviously continue to pray for Lori and Kate and Rebecca as they're heading off to their trip here in just about a month. Um, and then the Bakers have Haiti, but they're actually still here, right? Let's continue to pray for them and that recovery process. And uh, Ava, a praise. Okay. did amazing. He, and, and I never, I don't know much about any of this bone marrow transplant, but it said that he, um, because he is very fit and in shape, his bones were close to the skin, which he handed. This all seemed a little surprising. To me. <laughs> <laughs> but they said that um, the numbers that they would need for a, a donor were the 15 is the low end, 35 is the the high end, and this was 32.5. Wow. They were thrilled about. So they were able to take a liter of bone marrow from him. Oh. Which is amazing. Wow. And he said he was very sore. And it oh. was about a month's recovery for him. Um, but he's going to, he was going to go up yesterday. He evidently was still in the hospital to be able to see Ava. And, um, she uh, is doing well. She is able to be up and walking. It's still very weak. And now they are waiting for the stem cell count. Again, I, this is all very new to me. I, so I'm telling you, maybe some of you know better. And if those numbers are really high, it will mean that her bone marrow will recover much quicker. So this would be her stem cell count. It must be. It's, it's his. What oh, his? Okay. Thing. Will help her heal faster? Numbers, he will be completely 
replenished. <laughs> wow. Wow. So, um, and she will be in the hospital about 100 days because of her low immunity. Yes. So, if anybody has any more knowledge about bone marrow, I have not had time to, I just got this last night, to look into it, but it sounds like this was, to me, a huge. That's funny. At least she's up and about. Yes. Her mother is encouraging just her to eat better and start moving around because she's going to be a long time in this recovery. Yes. Wow. Anybody else? Got a bunch of pictures from AJ. He was actually able, after what a half a year there already, to actually take a a actual tour tour, not just PT running past sites, but an actual tour. Was that yesterday? Two days ago? Thursday? Thursday. Mm -hmm. Thursday. And uh, so we got a lot of pictures. Other than that, any others? I'm just really thankful for all the great for me to this cataract surgery. Um, my last doctor visit, everything was good there, everything was good, and so we're kind of easing off the eye drops. Yes. I don't really want one of those problems dropping all the time. Apparently, with this kind of stuff, some people can have a reaction if you just quit, you know, like quit cold turkey and yeah. you know, withdrawal issues. So, oh, wow. So far, so good. So. Very good. Classes that are on the border, so. <laughs> we would just pray for Mary. She's just oh, yes. cold and not feeling well. We wanted to keep her drums at her house today. Yes. Anything back there? Good to go? Anybody watching back there? Very good. We'll start with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you again for your word. We thank you for our time together. We thank you uh, for the very fact that it is you that unites us and uh, certainly that it is you that uh, certainly goes before us. And I certainly do pray that you would be with uh, Ava and certainly the continuation of these hundred days. We thank you for the praise of of her brother and the, the count for his bone marrow and all that that means. I, I just pray that you would certainly bring a continued health and uh, a continued recovery. And uh, we just are in awe of how you've orchestrated all these details to this very moment. And we thank you for that. I pray that you be with Calvary Baptist there in Peoria as well uh, with the uh, services as far as funerals that they've been going through. And then as well, many more who are, are uh, very ill at this moment. Uh, I just pray that you be with Pastor Gear and certainly family, and I pray that you strengthen them, encourage them. Certainly, a, a heavy burden upon their shoulders in this in these weeks, and uh, I just pray that even today, um, whether they're meeting in person or or remotely, I pray that you would just encourage them as a church and uh, draw them to you. and And I just certainly ask that you would. Uh, use testimonies for you, for your glory, for your honor um, in life and death. And we thank you for what you will do there. So that you pray for Mary as well, as she's not feeling well. Uh, I just pray that you give her a return to health and the rest that she needs and, and to be able to get back to work and uh, all the other routines that, uh, that she's involved in. And uh, certainly the other requests there on our screen, uh, maybe some that I'm overlooking that we were just mentioning, but I just pray that in all cases, that you would direct us as only you can, uh, that you would provide again as only you can. But I pray that you be for it with us, that we alone would honor you as we ought, 
uh, even in the midst of the storms, in the midst of the trials, in the midst of the needs, uh, that we be able to see you and your hand at work, even in in difficult circumstances. And uh, I just pray that you be honored now as we continue on in the service this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. This time we have special music. Very good. Thank you. We want to go to uh, Numbers chapter 25 here this morning. Uh, Numbers 20, chapter 25 as we, as we consider our thinking. Remember this at least the beginning. And it probably will wind up lasting the entirety of the year. Maybe next year the year after. <laughs> you never know. Um, but what are we thinking? And uh, this chapter is definitely a, I shouldn't even chuckle because it's rather disturbing, but a what are you thinking? What were you thinking? Uh, but we want to consider the thought of, uh, of sometimes how our confidence, our overconfidence uh, gets in our way. We could exchange that word pride, certainly that would fit there as well. But how often we live out such confidence, and I, I think that the Lord wants us to, to have boldness. He wants us to have courage, and uh, sometimes that equates into confidence as well and confidence in Him. Uh, but when our focus begins to shift from him to us and our confidence becomes rooted in me, uh, we will undoubtedly have some, some problems, as they certainly did here in Numbers chapter 25. But before we dive into this chapter, let's begin with the word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you again for your word. I thank you for the time that we can be together. Again, I do ask that you allow me to decrease, that you alone would increase. Again, I ask that you would Make the message clear that we'd be able to understand the application for us today here in Toulon. And uh, I just pray that you would challenge us, challenge me, and uh, direct our steps uh, accordingly as well. And we just give you the glory for the time that we have remaining here together. In Jesus' name, amen. The University of Alabama currently, as a side note, their basketball coach is uh, Nate Oates. Uh, he is a couple years younger, I believe, than myself. A couple years younger than myself, went to the same Bible college as myself. In fact, his dad was the dean of the seminary. Um, he is the professor of the last three classes I've taken. So Dr. Oates and I have spent a lot of time by email and uh, whatnot uh, in these last several months uh, in the classes I've been taking. But his, one of his sons, second, second son, I believe, one of his sons, is now the uh, basketball coach for the University of Alabama. Sadly, he just signed a new contract for in the general ballpark of, of three million a year. So I don't know how he went from Maranatha Baptist Bible College to a contract of three million a year, but that's how it all worked out for him. And uh, but anyway, long before uh, Nate Oates was <laughs> even born, and uh, I would suspect long before uh, his parents were even married, uh, there was. Uh, 
a coach, actually a football coach at the University of Alabama named Bear Bryant. The story is told during Bear's tenure as football coach at Alabama, he and some NFL friends, I was just in college, but he had some NFL friends, went duck hunting, and it sounds that they lack one thing, ducks. <laughs> uh, probably not that exciting time to go duck hunting without the ducks, but nevertheless, here's where they found themselves until finally one duck, lone duck, flew past them, and so Bear called it out for himself, said, hey, I'm, I, I've got this. So he, he pointed his gun in the direction of that duck and pulled the trigger, and obviously the gun went boom, and the duck kept flying. And uh, I'm guessing more humor than re reality, but in humor, Bear looks at the rest of them and says, would you all look at that? It's a pure miracle. That duck continues to fly, though he is dead. <laughs> um, you know how sometimes our, our, our confidence can challenge us in those regards. In 1911, a man named Bobby Leach was the second person uh, to go over the Niagara Falls and survive. The first one, I believe, was a lady, if I recall. But Bobby Leach in 1911 was the second one. He uh, designed a special steel drum uh, that was able to protect him, although he did get injured in the fall. I, I believe he had... Both of his kneecaps were uh, broken, and his jaw was fractured in the fall. But, but he survived, obviously. And it was said that he had so greatly calculated the risk and potential danger that uh, the way he landed and all that, it probably should have killed him even inside that drum, but he had calculated everything so exact uh, that, that he was able, ultimately, I can't say he walked away because, you know, two broken kneecaps, you're not going to walk away, but he was able to... Uh, survive easily. That was 1911, 1926, 15 years later. Bobby was on a public publicity tour in New Zealand and reportedly slipped, and you, I would almost think that this is made up, but he reportedly slipped on an orange peel in the street. His leg was injured, became infected, went into gangrene, became amputated, or had it amputated, and then died. The man lived through what is it, a 100-plus foot fall in a waterfall and walked away with a couple of broken bones. And, and uh, his demise would come from a fall in the street, of all things, on an orange peel. It would have been more classy if it was a banana peel, and I would really like to change the story, uh, change history and say it was actually a banana peel, but uh, allegedly it was an orange peel that he slipped on in the street, and it, it would be his, the death of him. We can literally say, in Numbers chapter 25, oh, on a humorous note, let me tell you a little humorous side note in our family. The first part is not humorous, this is not humorous, uh, but a classmate of ours uh, from Maranatha died this last week from, uh, yeah, this part is not funny. She died this week, uh, I believe from cancer, cancer. Uh, she was uh, several years older than us, she was an older student when she was going to college, but I think she was, may have been in your one of our classes, it seems like. I don't know, but she's in chamber singers. Yes. Me, but she did military first. And yes, mm -hmm. yes. So she went to college after military. She did the opposite of AJ. She did the smart way so that the government paid for her college. Um, but anyway, uh, so she was, and we knew her pretty well when we were there, and she just passed away this last week from cancer. But in college, she was hospitalized and nearly died from drinking water. <laughs> she... Whatever the terminology, and there's a medical terminology, but if you drink too much water, you will die. She was trying to avoid a cold. Yes, she was trying she to, was you know how you're supposed to, uh, yeah. In the hospital. Nearly, and nearly died from it. Died. Nearly died. But whatever that's called on the inside where you literally drown yourself, not because there's water in your lungs, but too much water in your bloodstream, and, and it pretty much just dilutes. and basically it turns your blood into, you know, as if you'd have a, well, water in your bloodstream and, and I think she had to have a blood transfusions and it was she was in the hospital for quite some time because she drank too much water so I, I have to say that and she survived that and then just passed away this last week from cancer um, but I've used that argument or her, her testimony many times in my family when my wife hands me a glass of water instead of root beer I'll say you know Laura nearly died from this well, yesterday, I'll kid you not, my wife, the very same week that Laura Blanchflower, whatever her married name is now, uh, Laura passed away, 
the one who's infa- infamously known for being in the hospital for uh, many weeks because of drinking too much water. Yesterday, my wife gave me three glasses of water. And uh, I told her, as she handed me the third glass, I said, really, again, another glass of water? I said, this is bad. The very week that we hear about Laura, she's trying to kill me off. And, and she's like, well, you've survived so far. And I said, well, you never know. I might go during the night. Uh, you're, you're, it's going to take some time. I know. My first words this morning when I woke up, I said, I'm a survivor. <laughs> I'm a survivor. I survived. I survived. You know what her words were? We're going for four glasses today. <laughs> In the name of Laura, if I die this week, <laughs> you will you will all have suspicions. <laughs> and it's now on record for all to know in here. <laughs> But anyway, back to the serious note, number chapter, 20, <laughs> number chapter 25 here. Uh, we have to deal with some overconfidence. Unfortunately, it has nothing to do with drinking water. First three verses, And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods, and the people did eat and bowed down to their gods. And Israel joined himself on the Baal Peor, and the Anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. You know, there's a confidence that we can have, and uh, I would almost dare say a confidence that we have had. So undoubtedly we have all fallen to this, unfortunately, where we turn victory into defeat. Remember exactly what has happened here as we're kind of describing where the nation of Israel is uh, here in verse 1. And it says, the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab, and they, that word they there is a feminine plural, which means it is the, the women. The daughters of Moab are calling the people onto the sacrifices of their gods. And the people did eat and bow down to their gods. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor. Do you remember? Uh, I don't know if I said this last week. A lot of times, obviously, I, I know I have said this in regards to Baal. Baal is kind of the terminology in, in ancient polytheism, Baal was ultimately the, the chief god. Uh, in polytheism, you'd have multiple gods. And, you know, if you were wanting a baby, you had a god that you worshipped for uh, uh, was fertility. If you were a farmer, you had a god that went for agriculture. If you were a fisherman, you had a god that you prayed to or worshipped in regard to the safety on the seas and whatever it might be. Uh, if you needed rain, you you prayed to the god of, of rain and, and so on and so forth. So they had a god for every natural aspect of humanity, a God for health, a God, you know, for all of that. But their chief God, which would be determined by the area. Uh, you know, Tulan, if, if we were in this pagan culture, Tulan would have their chief God. And probably I would dare say, not necessarily Tulan proper, but this area, if we were going to have a Baal, it would probably be a God of harvest because uh, we're a very farming area in this area. But nonetheless, here they have their Baal, which from my understanding, it's believed was honestly, uh, the God of harvest. Uh, and so obviously it must have been a, a more of an agricultural, or they hope to be an agricultural area. Obviously this is rather mountainous, so you would do a lot to try to please the God of the harvest because your harvest was already unlikely <laughs> uh, because of the terrain, because of the weather. And, uh, and so that God of the harvest was their Baal. It was their chief God. Remember where Balaam and Balak last meet? where Balaam last gives the blessing. In fact, I think he does it at least twice. Maybe some have called it three times, but it's kind of an ongoing statement uh, in regards to blessing the children of Israel. It was in Peor. And Balaam, obviously, because every community would have a different Balaam, Balaam would often have a, a dash and then the location name or as one. So Baal Peor would be the chief god of Peor which history says was the god of harvest. Isn't it interesting that here is pure where Balaam and Balak just were? Where, in fact, let me read the last verse of that last chapter. And Balaam rose up and went and returned to his place, and Balak also went his way. Here they are both, you know, they, they're not coming to an agreement. 
Uh, you're not going to curse them like I've called you to. And every time I've changed locations, you've blessed them even more. And uh, so here we're splitting ways. But they are splitting ways from Peor in the very place that Balaam has just given the nation of Israel ultimately final victory over all of their adversaries. Basically, he has declared to Balak that you are going to go down at the hands of the children of Israel, which was obviously contrary to what Balak was hoping for, King Balak. But in that very location, of the location of the worship of Baal of Peor, the god of harvest, in that same location, the children of Israel begin to worship that God. In the very location of the, the true God, the one and only God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has just given a blessing through the mouth of Balaam to the entirety of the nation in that very same location. They are falling to the worship of of a pagan god that could do nothing for them. Now, on a side note, step in my own humanity into their humanity, if we could do so, we, like I say it this way, uh, walking in their shoes. How many times have the children of Israel murmured because they had no food? How many times have the children of Israel murmured because they had no water? How many times have they cried out, let's go back to Egypt because we can't take this anymore? They begin to get word of a God that is obviously their supreme God in that general area of a God that allegedly, in their opinion, in the Moabites' opinion, provides a harvest, provides the rain that is necessary, provides the food that is necessary. Stepping into their shoes, I could understand, hey, here's a God that will do that. And uh, how many times we have been hungry? How many times we have been thirsty? How many times we have grown absolutely tired of this white stuff for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? And you mean to tell me there's a God that we can worship that will take care of this for us? You know, it's ridiculous because it's a false God. It's not doing anything. It is the God who reigns upon the just and the unjust. It is our God who reigns upon the just and the unjust, not Baal Peor. But kind of trying to figure out their mindset Obviously, it's hard to do because we look at it from as it's recorded for us many times with a, a shaking of the head in disbelief. How could you do this again? How, how many times will you fall? Well, undoubtedly, we've also neglected to look in the mirror and ask ourselves the same question. How many times will we continue to fall? How many times will we continue to do this? What is amazing to me when I just considered from victory into defeat, their overconfidence went from victory to great defeat. They went from in the same location, in the location of the worship of Baal Peor, the one supreme God says, I am blessing the children of Israel. In that same location, as victors, they fall in great, we could say defeat, not to the Midianites, not to the Moabites, not to any other of the ites in the area, but they fall to their own lust. They fall to their own passion. They fall to their own here and now carnal things. The conspiracy side of me uh, wants to think that uh, Balak, King Balak, after not getting the curse that he was willing to pay for, decided to give this a, an attempt. Hey, Balaam has been sent home. We have nothing more to do with him. He's completely failed us. The end of chapter 24, and the conspiracy side of me says, you know what ultimately happened is King Balak then said to the, the women of that exact area, pure, as they were looking down on the children of Israel, said, hey, why don't you go down there and try to seduce them? Let's go down there and see if we can make a, a connection here. Why don't you go down there and show them who our gods are so that they stop serving their God, who seems to be the meaning of, from Balaam's very mouth, the meaning of their victories. And so let's introduce them to our gods so that we can find commonality here and maybe they'll be our friends instead of our foes. The conspiracy theory within me says it had to have been King Balak that orchestrated all this. You know what is the sad reality if you go over uh, just a couple pages here to chapter 31, verse 16. Here's 
the battle against the Midianites for the children of Israel. Verse 16 says, Behold, these caused the children of Israel. Let me back up to verse 15. And Moses said unto them, Have ye saved all the women alive? Behold, these caused the children of Israel through the counsel of whom? Balaam. To commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor. And there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. What was the cause of the fall of verses 1, 2, and 3? Uh, my conspiracy theory mindset says it had to have been the king. It had to have been the king who didn't get what he wanted, who was going to go to the women now to try to seduce the men down below to, to get them to lose sight of what God was going to do for them. Let's try to overturn this, this blessing and turn it into a curse, or at least turn it into equals so they don't destroy us, as was just said. But who ultimately was the one that directed the women down to the men? It was Balaam. The very one whose mouth gave blessing to the children of Israel. Perhaps, we don't know the exact details. How do we get to verse 25 where they go their separate ways? To chapter 31 where Moses reminds them, hey, this was Balaam that did this. Perhaps it was something along the lines of, hey, I can't say what God you know, God blesses, I have to bless. If God curses, I have to curse. I, I'm not, I don't have the means to do anything else. But since I've just blessed them, king, maybe this would work. Try to overturn that. But you know, the sad reality, which is why I keep saying all along, we're not really sure where this Balaam guy is. We're, uh, at times he seems to be a righteous man. At other times he really does not. Um, I, I think ultimately we, we, we can't look too hard at the life of Balaam without acknowledging the sovereignty of our God. Ultimately, is how this all works out. But the victory into defeat. A place of great victory. A place that ultimately was great victory. They were just given a blessing from God that was giving them the victory over all. All nations ultimately were blessed. Well, all nations were cursed. But the blessing went through the children of Israel that, hey, children of Israel, you are going to be blessed to the point that they're going to all fall before you. One after one after one after one, they're all falling to you. You will be the victors time and time again. And King Balak is saying, whoa, whoa, remember? Psst, psst, stop it. Stop opening your mouth. Would you just stay quiet? You've know, got to stop doing this. He takes them to one more spot and Balaam lets loose again and he goes even farther in his blessing to them. So in this spot of great victory, they fall in great defeat. When they should have been marching forward, they were falling on their faces. You know, the question that I have there, how many blessings, how many, how many things does God have for us that we are missing out on simply because we have fallen to our own sin Instead of understanding the victory that we do have in Christ, we can sing, O oh, Victory in Jesus. It's at 812 in our hymnals. We can sing, Victory in Jesus. But then we live out our lives Monday through Saturday, and it, it often is contrary to what we just sang about. We have defeat after defeat after defeat. And many times that defeat comes because of our overconfidence in ourselves. Uh, I had a, kind of a subtitle on this. Is, uh, it's it's uh, keeping your footing on the slippery slope. Uh, a lot of times we think, well, I'm not going to slide. I, I'm not going to, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not, I, I won't fall. Well, you know, we need to be thinking that, or we maybe ought to not be thinking, I will keep my footing on the slippery slope. No, the, the truth is, is you probably won't. You're probably going to fall. Don't allow yourself to be on that slippery slope. I know I've shared this story, and I know when it happened, I certainly shared the story because I was rather sore. But right after the fire, when we were meeting at the uh, bank, the uh, fire was in October, middle of October, and so this was probably January time frame. We were still meeting at the bank, and uh, every Sunday morning, we'd have to load up a bunch of stuff that we had in our house, and we'd take it over to the bank, and we'd set up for our church services in their basement, and then we'd have the service, and then uh, we'd pack back up and bring most of it. They allowed us to keep some stuff there, but a lot of it we had to bring back home with us, and uh, so that was our routine week after week, and uh, my wife was well with child with Caitlin at the time, correct? Yeah, so it was Caitlin, Caitlin at the time. And uh, we went out to leave, and Mrs. Simmons, who doesn't attend here anymore, but Linda Simmons stopped by to see if there's anything that she could grab or throw in her car to help us, I believe. She was just sitting right out there. And uh, Jen went down the ramp that we had, because we'd have Wednesday night services at our house. So we had a ramp built so that everybody could get into our, the parsonage that was right here. She went down the ramp, not realizing it was just pure ice. 
and uh, she started to fall. And obviously, it's never a good thing for a, uh, a, a pregnant lady, especially as she's approaching the third trimester there, uh, to be falling. So me, myself, you know, the, the knight in rusty armor, uh, uh, kind of jumps for her to try to catch her. Well, obviously, she's not standing on this ramp that's full of ice. What's the chances of me doing that? Well, here we both are down, and uh, I, I think I kind of got a leg at least under her, so I cushioned her fall with a knee. I don't know how that's really any better than just falling on the ramp, but I cushioned her fall with my knee is how that landed, and I landed on the very edge. The, the ramp, like unlike our ramp here, didn't have any sides. It was just basically just for Milton Nicholas to get up into our home, and uh, so it, it literally was a dock that somebody from my brother's church took a dock from the lake, cut it in half, nailed it together and, and turned a dock into a ramp is how that worked out. So there are no sides or anything. And so I landed on the side and I broke my tailbone. And uh, so I'm, you know, I'm having a hard time sitting down. And, but all of this happened right in front of a church member. All of this happened literally on the way to church. All of this happened while we are walking into the bank building with still snow and ice on our backsides. And I think both of us were a little slower than normal on, on the, that particular Sunday. You know, we, we sometimes think, oh, I can keep my footing on this slippery slope. And the truth is, we probably can't. We probably shouldn't even be on the slippery slope. The Lord has given us the victory. Why do we stand on the slippery slope knowing that there's only one direction we go, and it's down? And so here, our confidence goes from victory to defeat. Verse 4, continuing on. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. And Moses said unto the judges of Israel, Slay ye every one of his men that were joined on the Baal Peor. Let me just stop right there. Uh, confidence, victory into defeat. Or we can say the wrong kind of confidence turns victory into defeat. The wrong kind of confidence turns sorrow into great disgrace. Kind of describing these first two verses, God again in seeing their sin says, I'm going to destroy them. And uh, his words there in verse 4, and there's some that argue there's a great discrepancy. God's words in verse 4 seems to make it see, seem that it says take all the heads of the people. Basically hang them. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any description of only the ones that fell into immorality, that fell into idolatry. It literally says, take all the heads. Now, what Moses says in verse 5, it says, slay every one of the men that were joined on the Baal Peor. Uh, some believe that the plague that followed may have been caused by Moses' kind of knocking it down one notch. I, I don't necessarily believe that uh, necessarily. Uh, let me say it this way. I haven't been convinced of that at this point. Uh, I think ultimately we don't have all the words that God said. You know, what verse 4 says is certainly not everything that God said to Moses. And undoubtedly, everything that Moses says in verse 5 is probably not everything that Moses said uh, uh, to the judges, to the rulers. And so we kind of have a, a summary of, of here's what was said. Nonetheless, Moses says unto the judges of Israel, Slay ye every one of these men that were joined on the Baal Peor. Look at verse 6. Behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brother an Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses, and in the sight of the congregation of all the congregation of the children of Israel, who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Let's stop at the last part of verse 6. What do we have going on at the last part of verse 6? We have at least a number of people. We're not told how many, but we have a number of people that are weeping. Why are they weeping? And not only they've just heard the word, every man is going to be hanging for the sin that they have just done. It could be that there's a lot of ladies here that are weeping over the loss of their husbands. It could be that there's a lot of ladies here that are weeping because they know that God is about to bring judgment and they don't desire it for their homes, for their families, for their husbands, for their sons. We are told later, and I, I believe that this plague started at this point, we'll just hear about it later. Uh, I believe that there's also, again, a plague that undoubtedly has happened or started because of the anger of the Lord. Uh, there that described in verse 4. And uh, so they may be weeping as well because they've already know that they've lost in their history. They've lost thousands of people by this plague. And here the plague has started again. 
Whatever it is, we know that there's a number of people sitting, gathered at the gate, or the entrance, I shouldn't say the gate, the entrance of the tabernacle, and they are on their faces before a holy God in weeping. Is that true repentance? I don't know their hearts, but it certainly would seem like there's at least a start of repentance there. Was there a great desire for mercy? I would confidently say yes. They are weeping and crying out to God for mercy. But in that setting, what do we have at the beginning of verse 6? There's a guy, again, in the wrong kind of confidence, takes one of these women, and this isn't done in secret. This isn't done up in Baal Pure. Remember, again, in pagan cultures and pagan idolatry and polytheism, often connected with uh, uh, the worship of the idols was prostitution. Those kind of went hand in hand. And, uh, and it seems from the first three verses, especially the second verse, that it seems that uh, as the children of Israel are falling into first, number one, the women, and then into the idolatry, it, it see, I would conclude that this is mostly taking place at Baal Peor. This is taking place at the worship site at the, uh, what do you call that, the high place of Baal Peor, which would have been the custom for the Midianites and the Moabites. But here we have in verse 6, a man brings one of the women into the camp of Israel. Right in the presence of Moses, right past all those that are weeping at the tabernacle. This wasn't a, you know, if it was going to happen in the camp, this wasn't a sneaking through the back door scenario. This man just boldly and blatantly marches her right past them all as they are there weeping and crying out for mercy. It is turning sorrow into great disgrace. And, and what a, again, a, a, a tragedy. What a, uh, I, again, I can't imagine the, I, I can't imagine the scene. Probably the, one of the most, um, I use the word precious, I guess one of the most precious, most memorable uh, events that we have had here. Obviously, every time that someone has been saved has been amazing. Uh, I would have to say that's probably the most precious because the angels rejoice at that. But uh, after the, uh, many years ago now, after the tragic accident of three high schoolers that were killed in an accident uh, outside of Kiwani, and uh, it hit the high school horribly, and really our community. I think that happened on a Monday night. On Tuesday night, we as a church opened up our church. This is when we didn't have that wall there, so the pews went all the way to the back. We opened up our church and spread the word that, hey, we're just going to have a time of prayer for the families involved, for the students involved, anybody and everybody that is wanting to come here to pray, please do. And I don't remember how, because Facebook wasn't as big as Facebook is now at that time. I don't remember how we got it promoted so fast, but the very next day we opened up the doors and this building was packed. The front pews were packed. We put up chairs on the sides and chairs in the back. And I believe there were still people standing in the doorway. It, it was an unbelievable sight. But what was more unbelievable, I started off, I think, with a devotional of, of reminding us that God is still in control. And God still has a work. And God still has a plan. And the need that we needed to pray for one another. And I started, with a, I started praying. And then my wife prayed. And I think there were a couple of church members prayed. And then as you began to hear these teenagers from town who were filling this building up, teenagers standing up and praying before God with tears Weeping, you know, they get all three words and then they're just weeping. Uh, it, it's one of the things that I will, I will never forget. Uh, for whatever reason, the news from Peoria was here, and we told them, "You got, you got to stay outside of the building. This is not a, this is not a publicity event. This is a, this is what we have to do now." Now, but I met with them after the service. Uh, they have the news here uh, again. We had the news here when our church burned down, but they have the news here to cover an event of a community-wide prayer time. Well, it was unbelievable. But that's what's happening here. We have the community coming together in prayer and weeping, and they're crying out to God for mercy. They're crying out for God for help. They're crying out for God that please don't bring the judgment. Please stop the plague. Please stop uh, uh, the hangings of, of these men that are dying before us. Please bring an end to this. We're crying out for mercy. And in that very setting, we have this man. Now, uh, I'm not trying to pull up any scabs from that time frame. I don't know that anybody has any connection anyway to, to that event. But 
uh, that accident that I was just talking about happened because of, uh, uh, I guess you say drug inhalants. Uh, the driver inhaled and then drove and blacked out and crashed at a very high rate of speed and it, it killed three of the four people inside the car. Could you imagine, and everybody knew that. Everybody knew at that point, by the, especially by the next day, everybody knew what had happened. And it was in the newspaper already. And Could you imagine in our prayer time if there would have been some dude in the back that's, that's inhaling? I, I don't remember what it was. It was like the spray, I think, the uh, air, compressed air or something. Look at like compressed air that you buy. Or some sort of, I don't remember, something like that. Could you imagine as we are all here praying that there's some dude in the back inhaling whatever you'd want to just go up to them and say what's the matter with you what is wrong with you why why here why now what what are you thinking of all times this is very inappropriate and, and honestly it would have been the probably the only time in the almost 20 years that i've been here that i would have asked somebody to leave if, if that would have happened i would have said no you you're out you leave this is this is not what we're here for Here's a guy that is so blatant in his sin, he marches this lady down into the tent in the midst of Moses, in the midst of these people crying out for mercy, and he has turned sorrow into great disgrace. I can't imagine the blatantness. Now, the wording that is involved there, many believe that that literally means that he has taken her to be his wife. Now, I'm not just being in, in a sexual way. I mean that literally a service has been for, performed probably on Dolly up on the top uh, in the high place, and he has come down with his new bride to show to the family. Uh, many seem to indicate that that's likely what had happened. The wording isn't exactly, but that's likely what this is, terminology is meaning. But either way, whether they're married or not, the reality of bringing this very woman who is a, a, a temple prostitute, we could say, into the camp of Israel with such disregard for Moses and those people crying out for mercy as your own fellow men are being hung because of the very same sin to a less extent than what this man is doing. Uh, it, it's, it's unfathomable. Weeping turn into great disgrace. You know what happens in our society, though, unfortunately, there is a, a concerted effort, there is an exact movement to try to get us so that we grow accustomed to what society wants us to follow, I guess for lack of a better way of saying it. You know what I'm trying to say? Where we no longer blush. I cannot tell you the irritation I have when we are watching television, network television, to watch the commercials. It's, and I'm not talking about the annoying insurance commercials. Those, those are sometimes funny, sometimes just plain annoying. Uh, and I'm not talking about the car commercials, but it, it's, it's amazing to me. And just consider how this works. It's amazing to me that a pharmacy, a pharmaceutical company, would promote a drug that is designed to help save the life of someone who has a deadly disease caused by the life choices of that person. That's the gist of the commercial. But in that commercial, they are promoting the bad life choices that brought about that disease. And I have to scratch my head and say, what is wrong here? What? But it's to get us just to grow accustomed to it. It's to get us to, so that we just, yeah, that's what it is. I, I, I can guarantee you our generation 20 years ago. So not even, we can't even, I can't even just say it's my parents' generation or my grandparents' generation. I'd say my generation, even just 10, 15, 20 years ago, would have been appalled. The, who's in charge of the television? Is that FCC? FCC. FCC. The FCC would have been appalled by what's presented today. But today it's presented as if, if we do this enough, we will stop being alarmed by it, and we'll be able to move our culture into a different direction. The question that I have, are we losing our ability to blush? Our overconfidence in being able to stand on a slippery slope, have we lost the ability to blush? This man did. There's no shame. There's no uh, embarrassment. There's no, oh, Moses is over there. Let's take this route. 
He marches her right past Moses. Inability to blush, inability to have shame, inability to say this isn't right, inability to realize that I, I can't do this. You know, in, in a normal heart, you would have to say, if, if suddenly you're in, in, in this great, great immorality and idolatry and you see Moses, just seeing Moses should have been enough to say, I can't do this. I, I, I can't do this. Yeah, you need to go back up to the top there. You, you just need to go. No, he just continues to march right on past them. I, I can't imagine that. Again, until we look in the mirror and realize how often we think we have such great confidence in ourselves. I can stand on the slippery slope and I won't fall. Confidence, sorrow into disgrace. Now, two negatives. Now, here's where our confidence ought to be. Confidence. Death in the life. Verse 7. And when Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose up from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand. And he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through the man of Israel and the woman through her belly so that the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. Let's stop right there. Here Phineas has observed this, as has Moses. I have to ask, what was Moses doing? What was Moses' response? Well, uh, what did Moses say? What, 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 what was going on through Moses' mind? I don't got to imagine, uh, what would he be, 120 years old or about at this time? Because he's about to die. Moses is about to die. Uh, I've, I've got to think that uh, uh, maybe he was just standing there going, <laughs> you know, the mouth open. What is going on? But it's young Phineas, the grandson of Aaron, he immediately saw, sees what's going on. What does he do? He grabs a javelin. He follows them and thrusts them both through, killing them on the spot. What does God do? He stopped the plague. You know what, what I find? as kind of a side note. What I find amazing about this, and I'm not calling us the battle here as far as, you know, um, what I was just mentioning is from the last point. What was that church in the south? I can't remember the name, and I don't need to say the name, but the church that's always causing issues in our nation. Whenever there's a death of a military man and they're picketing and causing a ruckus and, and all of that, and every, what was that? That's the one, yes. Uh, every, everything that has, is bad, they make a public scene to say it's because of, and they name something. Right or wrong? Uh, um, as we, as we consider what Phineas has done, do you realize that as there's a group of people, again, we don't have the number, but there's a group of people that are doing what in this very moment? They are weeping before their God, crying out for mercy at the entrance of the tabernacle. By being at the entrance of the tabernacle, it seems to indicate that it is truly before the one true God that they're crying out for mercy, correct? Uh, I, I think we could probably all agree on that. But what I find fascinating is that their pleas, their sorrows, their tears is not what stayed the plague. What stopped the plague? Phineas. He undoubtedly was a part of the people weeping and praying. Saw this perhaps out of the corner of his eye. I have to ask you a question. If he was praying, why were his eyes opened? <laughs> No, but he's weeping before a God, undoubtedly with the rest of them. He seems to be one who is in the right mind. He seems to be the one who is trying to strive for righteousness. And he sees what is going on. He grabs the javelin, and he, he puts feet to his prayer, we could say it that way. He follows through to know that, obviously Moses has just called out, everyone who's involved in this, they are to die. Phineas sees a guy that's literally in, the, in, the, in their tents, in their city of sorts, their campsite. There's one right there. I'll go take care of that one. And with great zeal, not in himself, with great zeal, not even in his own righteousness, and his great zeal, not because he was the grandson of Aaron, but in his great zeal for his God, he follows these two people into their tent and kills them both. And God answers the prayer of many. I find that amazing. I think God has called us to pray, but I think there's times that God has also called us to, to walk. He's called us to work. He's called us to a battle. But the question that I have, are we, are we fighting the correct battles as the, enemy of, as the army of God? As the enemy of God? As the army of God? Or are we B 
becoming the enemy of God by what we are or are not doing. Again, I'm not, I'm not trying to call us to be like uh, Westboro Baptist Church. That, that's not what I'm saying here by any means. But I think there's a lot of times that we're disgraced by what's going on around us. And we may spend time in prayer about it, but have we done anything else? Have we contacted the FCC and say, what's up with this? Have we contacted our legislators and said, no, this isn't right? Have, in our conversations with our, our coworkers, said, no, I, I'm going to stand with my God even though society is going this direction. I, I choose to side with God. Now, it's not just the point of just praying for mercy and praying for deliverance. It's sometimes there's a requirement for Phineas to say, hey, there's something we can do. And it was obviously commanded by God. So we can't just go out and start killing people. <laughs> That's not what this passage is about. God has already said these people need to be killed. And Phineas is obe obeying. He's following in obedience to what God has commanded him. But he does it with the zeal of the Lord, not in the zeal of himself. That's what's important. Uh, verse 9, and those that died in the plague were, notice this again, 24,000 people have died because of their fall, because they turned victory into defeat. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, had turned my wrath away from the children of Israel while he was, notice this is very important, while he was zealous for my sake among them. This wasn't about Phineas. This wasn't about Aaron's lineage. This wasn't about the high priesthood. This wasn't about the tabernacle. This wasn't about his own righteousness. God makes it clear. He did this because he was zealous for me. That I consumed not the children of Israel in my jealousy. Wherefore say, behold, I give unto him my covenant of peace, and he shall have it, and his seed after him, even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood, because he was zealous for his God. And made an atonement for the children of Israel. Now the name of Israelite that was slain. Can you imagine for all of, all of eternity? Here we have the names. The media sometimes doesn't like to give out names. God gave out the names. The name of the Israelite that was slain, even that was slain with the Midianitish woman, was Zimri, the son of Salu, the prince of a chief house among the Semenites. And the name of the Midianitish woman that was slain was Cosby. I, I'm just going to leave that right there. The daughter of Sir. He was head over a people and of a chief house in Midian. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Vex the Midianites and smite them. For they vex you with their wiles, wherewith they have beguiled you in the matter of Peor, and in the matter of Cosby, the daughter of a prince of Midian, their sister, which was slain in the day of the plague for Peor's sake. Remember what I was reading in chapter 31? They do that. They, they follow through with what God has called them to do, and uh, uh, they go to battle. They go to war. And Moses is reminding them in that moment, Hey, here's the reason why we're doing this. Confidence, turning death into life. Now, obviously, those 24,000 people didn't come back to life. But there would have been a lot more than 24,000 people dead had Phineas not had the zeal of the Lord in that moment right then. Are we fighting the crack battles as the army of God? Do we have the zeal of of the Lord to say, this isn't about me, this isn't about our church, this isn't about my own, I gotta show everybody how righteous I am. This is about my zeal, this is about my desire to serve and honor my God, that there are things that I have to do and must do and following in obedience, come what may, regardless of what happens. Come what may. As a side note in closing, obviously as the grandson of Aaron, killing somebody was not something that would have been the norm. Being around death was something that was prohibited. Uh, for Phineas to be where he was, he went against what he was supposed to be doing, except that God had called for all of these men to be killed, and Phineas's zeal for his God brought him even to a difficult spot to do what had to be done. And it saved the lives of potentially thousands. Do we have that kind of zeal? Do we have that kind of love for our God today? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you again for your word. I thank you for the example here of the children of Israel, certainly in bad ways but as well in a positive way. I pray that you would challenge us as we consider culture, as we consider our society, as we consider the direction that seems to be going, that our society seems to be plunging in lately. I pray that we would be standing true, that we would still be able to blush, that we would still be able to 
declare what is righteous, what is wrong and sinful. And I pray that you would use us, not in striking up battles where we ought not fight, but in being able to have the zeal for you. Even when our society is doing everything to ignore you. And uh, I pray that you would use us as you see fit. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.